Yeah. Yeah, in, uh, in 1972, I was doing my, uh, finishing my undergraduate degree in physics in this university, and there was uh, a conspiracy uh, just behind me that took me some time to realize that the main uh, conspirator was Professor Neumann, who is sitting here, and, and Uri Feldman, another person that some of the people here know, um, agree that it may be a good idea to send me over to England at the time to get my PhD there in astronomy. And then I, I did go to England and came back three years later, and I'm here ever since. So, so in a way, I owe Yuval uh, much of what uh, I've done after that. And so it's really a great pleasure to, to be here and, and uh, talk to you about a few things that in fact Yuval have done uh, in astronomy this time. Uh, among the many other things that he has done, and of course, I don't even uh, claim to know half of them. So I'm going to talk to you about black holes. These are the things that Yuval was very interested in uh, many years ago, and the evolution of galaxies. And I have to say a few words about the early universe and the first black holes, and then uh, talk to you about active and dormant sleeping black holes, and uh, black hole and galaxy evolution, and even attempt to say at the very last minute, and I'm going to be very careful here not to leave you time for any question about the connection between black hole and life, because this is highly speculated. So I'm going to uh, remind you some basic properties of black holes, not the fundamental properties of black hole, but rather the astrophysics of black holes. So this is the, the idea here. So in fact, there are three properties of black holes, as we know, the mass of the black hole, the uh, angular momentum of the black hole, and the charge of the black hole, and uh, we separate some of the properties are defined by either one of these parameters. One is called the gravitational radius of the black hole sitting here on the left, and the other one is the Schwarzschild radius, which is twice the gravitational radius of the black hole here on the right. So we are using this terminology in astronomy all the time. And if we go now the angular momentum, people are using the specific angular momentum. So if L is the angular momentum, which is of the order of the black hole mass time, the radius of the black hole time, the speed of light, because the, the, the horizon of the black hole must be rotating close to the speed of light. And then people are using the specific angular momentum, angular momentum per unit mass. And the parameter that is, that is used in general relativity is A. And you see how A is defined. A can go from 0 for a non-rotating black hole up to 1, which is a maximally rotating black hole. And I'm not going to say anything here about charge, only mass and angular momentum. So if we take black hole and we look at the accretion onto Schwarzschild and Kerr black hole. Kerr black hole is a rotating black hole. So I'm going to use some astronomical terminology. So I'll take a few minutes here and there to explain the terms to people who are not coming from astronomy. And so the astronomers will have to excuse me uh, for a few minutes here and there. So if uh, people are talking about the innermost stable radius of an object moving around black hole, and this is this R of marginal stability, OK? R of marginal stability is the innermost radius. And the idea is that if something is moving in circular orbits around a black hole, if there is a mechanism that makes this particle lose angular momentum, it can eventually spiral in into the black hole. And what astronomers are after is the amount of energy, the radiation that comes out as this particle loses its gravitational energy, just falls in. And you can see that this radius of marginal stability for a stationary black hole, one which is not rotating, is six times the gravitational radius, or so three times the Schwarzschild radius, and of course the number here is the amount of energy lost due to radiation. So as, as far further away you go with this accretion point, of course you gain less and less in terms of radiation coming out. So if the black hole is not rotating, you can gain almost 6% of the rest mass energy 
in radiation. If you go to rotating black holes, and these are some values of A, non-rotating and maximally rotating here, you see that you can get closer and closer to the black hole until you get all the way down to the gravitational radius of the black hole, and the efficiency gets larger and larger because the potential energy there is larger. So you gain more and more energy. So object accreted or gas accreted onto black hole can radiate from as little, this is not little of course, 6% of its rest mass energy, which is in fact not little, it's about six times more efficient than nuclear reactions, all the way down to more than 40%. So I'm going to talk about the efficiency of accretion because this will be related to the way black hole grow. So these are some properties of black holes that we have to take into account. And now let's go to the early universe and remind you a few things about the early universe. And of course, Vishay Dekel is going to talk tomorrow morning about it at much greater length. So I'm only going to take what I need for my talk regarding what we know about the universe. So what we know about the universe is first of all the energy and mass uh, budget of the universe. We know that matter, which is mostly dark matter, takes about 27% of this. Out of the 27%, about 4% is due to baryons, and all the rest is this dark energy. So dark matter, dark energy, and baryons, and this 4% is part of the 27%, okay? And the total sum exactly to one, which means that we live in a flat universe. Uh, the other thing that I need to, to remind you here is that what the Big Bang produced is basically uh, helium and hydrogen, and this only with very, very little amount of other elements, and there are about one atom of helium per 10 atoms of hydrogen, roughly that. We know it now very, very accurately. So this is what I need to know about the early universe, and this, this sets the stage, because what I want to discuss today is really uh, what happened at different time in the history of the universe. So I'm going to use something which I call cosmic clock. Right? Astronomers measure things either in time, which is written here, three minutes, 400,000 years, etc., all the way down to today, which is about 14 billion years after the Big Bang, or in fact, 13.7 is the best number that we have, or we can measure it in clock, in, in clock which is called redshift, the amount of shift or redshift a photon uh, underwent going all the way from a far object to here because of the expansion of the universe. And using these numbers, what I want to point out to you is that when the universe recombined, this is the time when the temperature was very low or low enough, about 4,000 degrees, electrons and protons combined together, the redshift at that time was about 1,500. And today it is zero. And here is another number that I'm going to use. Redshift of 6.5 correspond to less than 1 billion years. Why 6.5? Because today we are observing objects at redshift 6.5. And the reason we use redshift is this is a measurable quantity. We can measure it. We can take a spectrum of an object and measure the redshift. So it's better to use measurable quantities, and there is a simple translation. Every time that you give me a redshift, knowing the cosmological model, I can translate it to time. I'm going to use these times, but this is correct for every redshift that, that we know, because we know, we believe we know how the universe the law of cosmic expansion, if you want. So these are the cosmic clocks that we have to have for the background. And I want to mention that we believe, and we don't know that very accurately, that sometimes when the universe was about three or 400 million years old, the first stars were born. We are not sure about this number, but it's roughly there, a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. So. Um, I want to now mention the first uh, stars and the first uh, black holes, how they are related. So what were the first stars? What happened when the universe was maybe 300 or 400 million years old? What happened is that the first stars were formed. They formed out of the gas that was there at the time that collapsed due to its own gravity and formed big body that became stars the usual way stars are formed. So they collapse, the center heat up, and, and a star was formed. Now, these stars were definitely very large. We don't know how large they were, but they definitely were large enough to undergo supernovae explosion. 
And, the may, and the, what we think nowadays, and these are new ideas, we cannot prove them yet, is that most of them produce, after the explosion, a black hole in the center. So a very large star explodes when the universe was less than half a billion years old, leave, leaving behind a black hole. Now, how massive were the first stars? This we don't know. There are several guesses. Some people think that there are about 10 to 100 solar masses inside. You see even the small number is much larger than our sun. Some people think that even much larger, maybe 1,000 solar masses, maybe a million solar masses. We are not sure about this number. And because of that, we are not sure about the black hole size that is left behind. Because the fraction of the mass that goes into a black hole is something of order half, a third, a quarter of the mass of the star, but we don't know the mass of the star. So because of this, the earliest black hole, the most massive black hole, might have been 3 to 30 solar masses inside, but they might have been much larger. We don't know the mass of these black holes because we don't know the mass of the stars. I'm going to call them seed black holes because most of my talk, I'm going to talk about much larger black holes. So these are seeds black holes, but we don't know the number. Maybe 10 solar masses, maybe even 1,000 or 4, or, or even 10,000, or even larger numbers. So there is an uncertainty here which will affect some of the things that I'm going to describe later on. So this is the general scenario. This is what we think when the universe was about a half a billion years old or even, even young. Here is another point that I want to introduce to you some astronomical terminology. And this is called adding to luminosity. And astronomers know it uh, and dream about it. I wouldn't say love it all the time, but they have to. to to live with it, and it's related to the question of how to grow massive black holes. And, and we think that massive black holes grow from small black holes by accretion. Matter is accreted onto the black hole, and when you accrete something onto a black hole, and the idea is that there is a black hole here somewhere, and around it some matter, and this matter is being accreted, and there are two forces to consider. One is the, fo one is the force of gravity pulling matter onto the black hole, and the result of the radiation emitted in, this, emitted in this process is radiation pressure force pushing the particles out. So this one pulls them in, this one pulls them out, and we can do the balance of forces. This is quite easy. We can write the radiation pressure force. Let me mention two terms here. This is the luminosity, the energy per unit time. Here is the Thomson force section because we are dealing with electron, with radiation pressure on electrons. And here is gravity, of course. And the idea is to say that there is no way to accrete more than a certain amount. Because once you go over this limit called the Eddington limit, the radiation force is so large, it will stop the accretion. Okay? So you accrete matter more and more and more. More and more radiation is emitted or more and more power is emitted until you reach the moment where the two
And in fact, one more familiar to people who work in general relativity because it's related to so-called uh, Einstein-Rosen bridge. And the idea is that Einstein a Rosen bridge can connect our universe on one side to another universe on a different side through a wormhole right in here. And this has was some very popular idea for some time. So you can think about material going onto the black hole here and disappearing and appearing in a different universe here. Or if we stand up here in our own universe, material just coming from a different idea. So, so this is what Yuval had in mind in 1972. But I think I told you that in 1972, he also had something in mind about me. So um, I was trying to think about well, what did he have in mind about me. Um, the real answer will be given probably in, I don't know, 10 years when I write my memoirs. But uh, the, in a minute, I think that at that time, he was starting to be very unhappy about this idea. So perhaps I'd like to think that he sent me overseas to learn what quasars really are and, uh, and, and tell him what the story is. I don't think he believed in that much longer. Uh, after 1974, when this paper was was uh, written, so in a way I, I, I paid him back in some way because I think I made some contribution to understanding of them. But of course, there are hundreds of people working on this, really hundreds of people, and and what I'm showing today is the result of many many groups who reached these ideas. This involved a lot of work and a lot of observations. So now let me take you to the other type of black holes. I already told you about active black holes. And now let's talk a little bit about dormant black holes, those that are sleeping there. Because black holes is not necessarily accreting matter all the time. Sometimes there may not be any material around it, so it'll just sit there very quietly doing nothing. So uh, dormant black holes, in fact, we see all over the place. And when I say we see, I mean that we have indirect evidence for dormant black holes. These are mostly dynamical evidence. We see star motion and gas motion close to centers of galaxy, galaxies that tell us that there is something very massive there, but we do not see the radiation. This is a picture of the center of our own galaxy, and as you can see, the scale is very, very small. One light year across the size of our galaxy is 100,000 light years from one side to the other. So it's a very small part, and we believe that right in the center of our own galaxy, right in here, there is a dormant black hole. In fact, it's not quite dormant. It's occasionally is doing something. Occasionally, it is swallowing some material. And when we look at the X-rays, and this is the best way to look, because this material is moving so fast that when it collides, it produces high temperatures and X-ray radiation. In the X-ray, we see the evidence for this black hole. And in fact, people nowadays can measure the mass of this black hole because they can measure the motions of stars and gas in the center of our own galaxies. And we know what it is. It is roughly 3 million solar masses in size, in mass. So right in the center of our own galaxies, there is a massive black hole. We know it quite well. We can measure it. And what has become apparent over the, the last uh, a decade or so, or less than that, is that all in the center of almost every galaxy, there is a dormant black hole. So if when I talk to you about active black holes, I was talking about 1% of the population. When we talk about the entire population of galaxies, in almost every one of them, there is a dormant black hole. Of course, the numbers we can measure are very small. I'm going to show you some numbers about dormant black holes. And the number only amounts to a few dozens. But if we do it properly, we can, we can uh, estimate from that what is the number in the population. And the amount come out to be such that in, in the center of almost every galaxy that we look at, there is a massive dormant black hole. And uh, some, uh, diagrams like this, this is the second time you, uh, no, this is the first time, sorry, that this diagram is shown here. And what is shown here is the galaxy mass compared with the black hole mass. Here is the black hole mass in logarithmic units. And these are some funny uh, units astronomers use 
to measure, uh, in fact, the galaxy mass. In fact, what is written here is, the, is a typical motion of the stars, which we translate to the mass of the galaxy using some dynamical methods. But basically, you see that there is a very strong linear relationship between the two. The larger the galaxy, the larger the mass of the black hole is. And these are the numbers, roughly. The bulge is the center of the galaxy, where most of the stars are. In elliptical galaxy, it's all the galaxy, OK? So we see that less than 0.2 of 1%, roughly 0.2 of 1% of the total mass in the galaxy is due to a massive black hole. Remember, when I did the sum for the entire universe, comparing X-ray radiation to the amount of baryons in galaxy, I got something like one-tenth of 1%. So this was done for the entire universe, a global mass estimate and energy estimate for the entire universe. This one is done for individual sources, and the agreement is quite good. The agreement is quite good. So we have evidence that this total sum, energy bar, the total energy bar that is really working well even in individual sources. Um, a few uh, digression a little bit about how we know the mass of the black hole regarding active black holes. And uh, I'm very proud to, to tell you about it because much of the work here was done uh, locally at the Wise Observatory. Without going into the details, there are ways to measure the mass of black holes. And the reason is that if we look at the very center of such sources, we see on top of the black hole right in the center with an accretion disk around it, we see many, many clouds. They are not square in nature, I think. But these are uh, moving around, and we know that they move in Keplerian orbits, more or less. It's a bound system. So what we have to do, we have to measure the distance between these clouds and the black hole, and we have to measure the velocity and just use Kepler loads. And over many years, it's not as simple as it sounds, but over many years, uh, there were methods developed to do it. And, and, and much of the work was done here at the Wise Observatory by a large group of people uh, and mostly uh, two people that are in the audience, uh, Dan Maozo is here, Shai Kaspi is here, and, and myself, but other people took part. And uh, over, after 10 years, we, wrote, we reached a diagram. I know that you cannot read the scale here, but basically what the diagram is telling us, that if you measure 35 objects, you can relate the size of this system of clouds with the luminosity of the source, which is something that you can measure very easily. And then we just use Kepler law. We use Kepler law, and what you have to see, here is the V square from the Kepler law, because we try to deduce mass, and here are some numbers that go here, and here is the luminosity of the source. So every, in every, every time astronomers are measuring now the mass of black holes somewhere in a faraway galaxy, where there is an active black hole, they use this relationship and uh, let me show you, uh, using this relationship, the most massive black holes we know about. So they are in this diagram, the mass of the black hole here. Each point is a measurement, so about 100 of them, or less than that, a little less than that. And this is the luminosity of the source, just to scale 10 to the 48 is as luminous than 10,000 galaxies like ours, OK? Our galaxy is 10 to the minus 4. So there's one source here that emits 10,000 more radiations than the entire galaxy we live in, which is a very large galaxy. Okay? So the most massive black holes that we measure nowadays are larger than 10 to the 10 solar masses, larger than 10 billion solar masses. So some of these are very, very large compared with the small black holes that were present in the early universe. Okay, so some of them are extremely uh, large. And, and another question we can ask uh, at this stage is, are they obese? I mean, are they trying to swallow as much as they can? Just, you know, like some people go to McDonald's, perhaps, and try to get as many cheeseburgers as they can. Or are they anorexic? Are they just doing it very, very slowly? And the reason I mention it is because what we measure is luminosity. Sorry. What we measure is luminosity, and luminosity translates not to the black hole mass, but the amount of materials they gobble, okay? So let me give you the, the answer right away. These guys are obese. Not only that they are huge, they actually swallow as much as they can. If I speak about it in terms of the Eddington luminosity, 
you remember how much material you can swallow. They swallow as much as they can. Okay, so just do it. Okay, so there is some material around, let's just swallow it, who knows what will be next? Who knows what will happen in, in a billion years? So they just swallow as much as they can. This is not the case for some of these guys that are small compared with them. Some of them may be anorexic. Maybe they may swallow only 1% of what, they can actually, of what they actually have in the surroundings. So objects are different in the mass and the amount of material they go by. Okay? So I now I come to the title of, uh, of my talk, and, and let me try and, and, and explain in, in 10 minutes or so what people think nowadays about the evolution of galaxies and about the evolution of black holes. Let me remind you again that Avishai Tekel in his, in, in his talk tomorrow, I didn't talk to him, but I'm sure he's going to tell you about galaxy evolution. So I'm, I'll, I'm going to be brief about this aspect, I'll, I'll, but I'll, I'll tell you about how they go together. When we look around us, we see that many galaxies collide with each other. Look at the nine pictures here, and what you see is very common when you look around in the universe, especially when you look in a, ver in a very far universe, at large redshift. As we go further and further back in time, we see more and more galaxies that collide. So collision between galaxies, merging of galaxies is a very common process, and we believe that the galaxies grow in this way. The first galaxies must have been much smaller. Collisions between galaxies must have been very frequent. Every time two galaxies collide, another galaxy come out, which is larger, and then two like this collide, and galaxies grow in time. In the first few billion years of the age of the universe, galaxies were growing. Now, what the, the, the emphasis that I want to put here is what happened in, for the black hole in the center of the galaxy. Let's assume that in the center of each galaxy there was a small black hole. And as the galaxies merge, the black holes merge too. So two small galaxies became a large galaxy, two small black holes became a larger black hole. And we believe that the process is going on all the time, except that in the early universe it was much faster. I'll show you why in a minute. So here are some, some examples that show you that galaxy collision is in fact very common. Uh, here is another pair of galaxies colliding. It'll take them much longer time because they're very far away, but eventually they will collide, and if there is a black hole in the center of each, which we believe, the two will merge. So uh, this brings me to, to maybe the, the, the last topic, ma major topic in my talk, which is the correlation or the connection between galaxy mergers and now not black holes, but star formation. And this is another uh, astronomical issue. Astronomers believe that as galaxies merge together, this is an episode of a very large, or very intense star formation event. Stars are forming very, very fast when two galaxies merge because there is a lot of material poured into a very small region. This is exactly what is needed to produce stars uh, very, very rapidly. And galaxies collide all the time. Here is another example. And in fact, the ones that are collide and produce most of the energy that we see are called ultra-luminous infrared galaxies because we see them mostly in the infrared, ultra-luminous infrared galaxies. And I want to focus on one in particular uh, this, this one uh, is a very well-known ultra-luminous infrared galaxy. And if we take the image of the two and zoom on it, we see that we catch the system during a collision. We look at two galaxies colliding as we speak. It's a relatively fast process. What, what I mean by fast, only maybe a billion years. So that's fast. It's only 10% of the age of the universe or less. And let me show you a bit more on this system, on the left side, space telescope image of the system of the center, it's a big mess. When two galaxies collide, it's a big mess. On the right hand side, the X-ray picture. And there are two points, one black hole, another black hole. There are two active black holes. So each one of them contain an active black hole, and the two black holes are just on the way to merge into one. How is this related to star formation? It happened in astronomy that the best way to look for star formation, one of the best ways to look for star formation, is in the X-ray part of the spectrum. So let me show you a galaxy which is known 
to have very, very <coughs> intense star formation going on without a black hole. And this is the galaxy with the two black holes. And what I'm going to do next is compare the X-ray spectrum of the two and see whether in this one I have indication of star formation. So these are two X-ray spectra. This is the well-known star forming galaxy. This is the one with the two active black holes. And it's very noisy. These observations are very, very difficult to, to obtain. But if you compare the two, you can see all the features are going up and down. These are emission lines that are really very, very similar. I won't take you through the spectroscopic details, only the result. And the result is the starburst activity produce metals. I'll come back to this uh, point. The starburst activity produce dust. And we see them in, in all these uh, sources. And uh, let me remind you, those who are not astronomers, that the reason why we know they produce metal is because starburst activity means lots of supernovae explosion. This is what we mean, starburst activity. So I talked about merging black holes and talked about emerging galaxies. And now I know that the two processes are related also the, to the formation of stars. And because of that, the formation of metals. So uh, here is another uh, thing trying to summarize what I've told you about black hole growth and, and evolution, but now combining the first black holes with the evolution of galaxies and black hole through mergers. And this is the last uh, part of my talk. Let me take you some of the algebra first of all. This is a reminder from the first slide. This is the L over L Eddington, this uh, ratio which tells us the accretion rate over mass. This is the way uh, we measure luminosity. L is luminosity, M dot is accretion rate. You see that I have a small correction here because if material is converted into energy, then this matter is not flowing onto the black hole. So the black hole is not growing as fast as I assumed earlier. This is the reason for 1 minus epsilon, and epsilon is the efficiency. I have to be careful here. So I, took the, I take the two together, and now what people are, are doing is very, very simple. They assume that when there is an episode where a black hole grows, the accretion rate is proportional to the mass of the black hole. So beta is a constant, and you can see that this constant has dimension of 1 over time. And then we solve it, and we, we see that during one episode, there is an exponential growth of the mass of the black hole. You accrete a lot of material during some time, there is an exponential growth. And now I'll take the two together, and I'll show you the solution of this very simple uh, approximation. And here is the solution. I can convert everything to time, which is basically 1 over beta. This is the time of growth. This is number in years. And you have to look at some of the numbers now. This is four, 400 million years. And what is it telling us that during, this is an e-folding time. During 400 million years, if I adjust some of the parameters here correctly, <laughs> the black hole mass uh, increased by a factor of E. Okay, it's an E-folding time. And these are the black hole mass and the seed black hole. This is the early black hole, what started the, the, the process. This is the end result. And there is another factor here that tell you 1 over F active, meaning that some of the time the black hole is dormant. Some of the times they don't do anything. And I only have to, to account the time that's when they gobble material. Okay. So given these, we can measure the growth time of black holes and compare to the growth times of galaxies. And then ask the question, is it really true? Is it really consistent with the idea that I told you uh, about that when two galaxies melt, the two black hole melt, there is a lot of material there, and some of it goes into the black hole and make it even larger. So this is the, the idea. One other uh, point about it before I get uh, to my summary. Uh, I told you that when two black holes merge and two galaxies merge. This is an epoch where lots of new stars are formed. And when lots of new stars are formed, there is a lot of supernova explosion. And this is the way that the matter we, we see around us, like this, is, is being ejected to space. Okay? So they, all the things are related. Black holes are probably related to galaxy formation and galaxy evolution. This must be related to episode of star formation. And this must be related to episode of enrichment. Astronomers call it enrichment. Episode where lots of new heavy elements are being expelled into space by supernovae 
explosion. And this is the same factor that you saw here, L over L Eddington along this axis. And this is some measure of metallicity that astronomers uh, use when they measure things like that. And as you see, as the accretion rate grows, the metallicity grows too. This is a new result. It's only a year old. It's uh, there is a very large scatter, but I think there are some good indications that metallicity grows. And when black holes are very obese, they really gobble a lot of material. During the same time, lots of heavy elements are produced. Um, why is that important? I'm coming back to the early universe. You remember that my cosmic clock, one cosmic clock, is the redshift. And at a redshift of larger than six, the universe is less than a billion years old. And we see some objects in the universe when the, where the redshift is larger than six, so we see them less than a billion years after the Big Bang. And if we look at them very carefully, we see that these objects are showing very strong emission line, and I will not do the spectroscopy here, due to iron, due to carbon, due to nitrogen, due to heavy elements. And one of the questions is, was there enough time in the universe, assuming this process, to produce so much heavy elements like argon and carbon and, and oxygen, etc., to explain the spectrum? Because this is relatively short time. The age of the universe was 14 billion years. So even the earliest object that we see already lo have lots of material in them. And this brings me to what people uh, are doing in order to try and understand it a bit better. Because these are complicated processes. There's no analytical way to investigate them. So what you can do is either do observations, very accurate observations, with a lot of development on this area, or do numerical simulations. And the numerical simulation I'm going to show you, a one here, is uh, trying to mimic this process that you see. A seed black hole, an explosion of a star that leaves behind a seed black hole, or perhaps two black holes that merge when the two galaxies merge and produce something that, uh, on top of a larger black hole, also leave in the center lots of new stars. So this is a simulation that caught a lot of attention recently, appeared in nature. This does not mean that it's any better than other simulation. But um, let me show you what the idea is. So two galaxies, now made, each one made out of some million particles, and what you have to do is follow the clock up there, 80 million years, 100 million years, as the two evolve. It's probably one of the best. And occasionally, there are some very dramatic events. I'll point them out. It's about one minute simulation. There are two things that look like two galaxies. Remember, each one of them had a black hole in the center. I, I don't know the exact detail of uh, how massive was the black hole. We are already approaching one billion years. Look at the clock on the left side. And now they will undergo another collision. These are uh, remote collision. Now see that there is lots of wind. Some supernova explosion that drive a lot of material away from the system. You'll see some more of it in a few seconds. Now it's really a complete mess. And you see some of the materials being ejected. There are huge supernova explosions that send all this material out into space. And uh, I think it's getting to the end of it. Let's see what is left when we finish. It's like a movie, so the what is left is probably credits at the end. Uh, so it's now start to look again like an ordinary galaxy. Yes, there are credits. Okay, so these are the people who did a calculation. I should give them credit. Uh, Springel from MPA in Germany, uh, Dimitau from MPA, Anquist from Harvard. So they did a simulation, and what they tried to do is try to calculate at the same time what happened to the black holes, what happened to the stars, and what happened to the gas. So what we have to do, of course, is we have to look at nature and ask the question, these are different shots during these events. Do we see in nature anything that resembles this? Definitely yes. Do we see in nature anything that resembles this? Definitely yes. Is the answer definitely yes all across? I'm not sure, but probably many of the stages we do see in nature when we look at different systems. And this is the if this is the case, so that's another proof 
that some of these simulations are probably working out, calculating what is happening in nature, what happened in nature uh, in, in, in the early universe quite accurately. But of course, you realize what is involved and how much calculation power is needed and how many processes. So, sorry? The black holes here are right, they, they became one black hole. I'll, I'll, I'll finish in a minute, so I'll show you. Right now, one is here and one is here. One is here and one is there. But here, the two of them merge. This is the final process. And the entire process took here almost two billion years. Okay? So there are basically four steps to, uh, to grow black holes, and that's the way we think about it now. So here are two galaxies colliding. Two black holes, maybe one is larger than the other, getting close, one in each nucleus in the center of each one of them. They get closer, they get even closer, and eventually they merge and the two galaxies merge. Okay? So we have merging black holes, so what happens is that black holes are now larger and on top of it there is a lot of new supply right there. So they keep growing by accreting matter. The two galaxies became one, and on top of it there is lots of heavy elements and metals, what astronomers call metal, that have been produced during the process. So um, if I want to summarize this under the, 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 the title From Black Holes to Life, and this is the part that I told you I'll only leave a minute to because it's highly speculative, not the first three points, because the first conclusion is that episodes of, uh, of rapid black hole growth are associated with galaxy mergers and galaxy evolution. I don't think there is any doubt about it. We actually see it in nature in many places and in the near future, I'm sure, will be many more examples. So this is quite secure. The other one, conclusion B, is that episodes of rapid black hole growth are associated with energetic starburst event. You saw the simulation, you saw some X-ray spectra that seem to support this idea. And some of the baryon might have been ejected from galaxies during such events. You remember that the number of baryons in the universe that you see in galaxies are only 20% in galaxies. And we think that more than half the baryons are between galaxies. And these might be cases where the baryons are driven away uh, from the galaxies and in fact some of them we, we don't see even nowadays. We start to see them perhaps. Most of the baryons we, we don't actually see and they might have driven from galaxies during such events. And conclusion number three, which is a bit more speculative, is that nitrogen, carbon, oxygen, and iron content of galaxy may be related to black hole growth. And, and because it's the end, and because I allow myself to be speculative, so I called it from black hole to life, uh, and uh, I specifically want to uh, show one more thing that astronomers uh, know about. This is the, the number of, the amount, the relative amount of elements in the universe difficult to see, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, neon, etc. all the heavy elements, hydrogen and helium here, so it, it came out not too clear. You see this is typical composition of galaxies that we see around us and stars that we see around us, and the speculation here is of course uh, because it's related to this thing and maybe there is a relationship between the events of black hole grow, and, and this is related to life, because without these elements, would not be life. And the reason I put it here, and I'm going to finish with this, is because I know that over the last few years, uh, Yuval became very interested in, in, the, in the beginning of life, and mostly the evolution of life. So maybe, in some ways, what he did in 1967 and 69 and 72 about black holes may be related indirectly even to life 30 and more than 30 years after that today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, are there any questions for you? Yes, many. The question was uh, as, uh, are people doing uh, simulation with non equivalent, you probably mean large galaxy with a small galaxy? Oh, yes, yeah, <coughs> many, many simulations. Uh, no, yes, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Most of the collisions are between a small galaxy and a larger galaxy, and there are many simulations like this. The one that I picked is only because it's the most detailed of its time. It only appeared a few months ago. But yes, this has been done. The shapes, 
people are able to produce shapes that we see around us. That's right. They, when two galaxies collide, in fact, what really collide are not galaxies but halos. These galaxies are inside big halos of dark matter. So the real collision, dynamic collision, dynamical collision, is between the halos. But what is left behind in the simulation is not too far from what we see in nature in terms of shape, if that's what you're asking about. Any other questions? Yes, please. Yeah. Can you get the explanation when uh, not so uh, uh, numerous population of the binary stars, okay, 100 observed black holes in our galaxy, but much more uh, uh, populated, uh, generated stars. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand. Do you mean that the, the population of stars is different? You distinguish between population one and population two? Okay, let me answer this briefly because it's really very technical. Is it possible to observe the black holes? Let me, answer, let me answer the first question. I, I believe, if this scenario is correct, the black hole that we see in our galaxy is the result of collisions between galaxies before it was our own beloved galaxy. Probably the two smaller galaxies that merged together and even previous attempts like this. So what you see in the black hole, the metals there, not that it matters because it's inside a black hole, but the gas there that went into the black hole is probably the result of earlier galaxies that form our own galaxies. So I would not make a direct connection between stellar population, sorry for the non-astronomer, and, and the, and the uh, black hole right in the center. It's, it's more involved. It's more involved. Yes, Maybe part of this answer, question or not. You were talking about several different black holes. So in the beginning you talked about active ones, which are small. Mm -hmm. several. All of a sudden, we, are, we have huge ones. Mm -hmm. Any connection? Yes, the, the idea is that you start from very small ones. Let's say in the early universe, maybe a thousand solar masses, ones. And then when two galaxies collide, yes, the two collide, and on top of it, there is a lot of material being poured onto the center. And then the two collide, they merge, and then there is a lot of accretion. There is an episode, which is relatively short, well, the, the, the resulting black hole grow, and then you have another, and then there may be another collision. So it will grow again. There are several episodes like this. So you grow in time, and this was the point of showing the growth time of the black hole. There must have been several episodes in the life of every galaxy before the final black hole with the final mass uh, uh, reached uh, its, its final mass. Then, Gravitational collisions, say between stars, usually you have elastic scattering. The merger is a very weird thing. Um, what is your relative to say about two black holes? Do they tend to merge? Do they have a large cross section? Ah, uh, yes, the cross section is quite large, and the reason is that uh, um, if once you get close enough, you lose a lot of energy by uh, gravitational radiation. So it's not just the dynamics. And once you get the two into orbit in orbit one uh, around the other, about around the central uh, center of mass, then you lose energy by a gravitational, uh, emitting gravitational waves. And then the two, the, the, the orbit decay and become a black hole. This has been computed quite accurately, yes. Yes, please. Is our galaxy being approached by another galaxy? Oh, yes, more than one, more than one. In fact, you have nowhere to escape because there is one from the south and another one from the north. <laughs> But it'll take a good few million years, in fact, tens of millions of years. Yes, our galaxy is, in fact, in a process of colliding with one or two other galaxies. <laughs> it'll take some time, though. So. Okay, there are no more questions. We thank you again.